Okay, good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Thankfully, the wind has let up for us. Okay, well, today we're going to be talking about some of the fun plants that we sell. And since this is right in front of me, we'll start with the strawberries. Um, strawberries are actually native throughout the northern hemisphere and, interestingly, the west coast of South America. It's where they were found growing originally. And the modern strawberries, which are the big ones you see at the supermarket and all, were created by hybridizing the European type with ones found in the eastern United States with ones found in the western United States. And what, ones in the west coast of the North America and South America are the same species and they happen to have the size. The European ones happen to have the flavor. Uh, so the, the strawberries that we sell today are kind of a hybrid of those three types. The European and then the two ones from North America. Um, back 30 years ago, I considered this to be kind of the normal size of a strawberry plant. <laughs> And then we started studying more about dirt because, you know, I, I always remember strawberry plants growing about 10 inches across, 8 to 12 inches across with berries about so big. And we had always heard that the farms plant them 18 inches apart. We're going, well, that seems like a waste of space. But then when we figured out, finally figured out in the early 90s what good soil is, we grew strawberries in pure sand and the plants were easily two foot wide. So, so healthy strawberry plants can grow quite big, but most potting soils, they don't. So we created our potting soil back in the early 90s, and we get a fairly good-sized strawberry plant in that. I would say that's a good, these plants are probably about uh, 18 inches wide, maybe close to 20 inches across, which should be the normal size for them. So with leaflets this large or larger, I mean, we've seen them bigger than this. This is still fall, come spring, you can get leaflets about that big, four inches across or so. So that's what you should expect if you have healthy plants. I had a customer email me about strawberry, his strawberries growing in a soil that was not to our liking, and his plants were about a little bigger than this in his photos that he showed, uh, showed me. So we knew that uh, it wasn't the right soil. Um, now, strawberry plants, the way they grow, the ones that we're more um, we interested in, uh, pardon? Mm -hmm. Do you have different kind of uh, soil for different kind of uh, fruit trees? I mean, in this case, we are talking about strawberries. We grow the same soil. We use the same soil for any plant. Oh. If it's good soil, it's good soil. I can't get around that. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, Let's talk about what the farmers do first. So in the fields out, out in Orange County, they're already planted, and, and that's because they are their crop, Orange County crop, which is the, up until, you know, this last year, it was the most cash-producing crop in Orange County. Now it's probably going to be marijuana, but <coughs> strawberries for 50 years were the most money-making crop in Orange County, and the farmers geared their entire year to grow strawberries. Uh, I had some relatives... They're not in the business anymore, but they had some fields in Cyprus, and they told me if they had a good year, uh, they bought one of their kids a house. It was that profitable. You know, they're making clearing $50,000 a year uh, in the 1960s off of a strawberry crop, which was enough to buy a house in those days. So it was a very prof, and they only had like five acres, $50,000 uh, profit. So nowadays that would be more or less uh, maybe eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars profit on the same size field if they have a good crop of strawberries. So strawberries definitely can make a lot of money. Um, California grows eighty percent of the strawberries grown in the United States, and the average yield in California is one pound per square foot. And you know one plant pretty much uses up a square foot. So you can say about one plant, one pound per plant or you can also say about a quart of strawberries, one quart basket of strawberries per plant. So you kind of, if you want to know how many strawberries to grow, you have to kind of figure how many you want to eat per week. 
because one quart is probably, well, if you divide that throughout the whole year, that's not very many strawberries per week. That's like less half, half of one per week. So uh, I remember when I was younger, and I, my kids, you know, we had a family of four. I had 10 strawberry plants in my backyard, and that wasn't bad. That, that was maybe at the peak of the season, maybe 20 berries a week. That wasn't bad. Um, so they, you know, they're, and the strawberries, now there's two kinds that we sell. Uh, there's this, what are called the spring bearing strawberries where they do most of their production winter into spring. And then there are the ever bearing strawberries which scatter more throughout the year. Well, the, both the spring bearing and the ever bearing, their heaviest production is spring, March to June or July. The heat shuts down most blooming on strawberries. The ever-bearing ones will kind of shut down for a month or so. And the, but as soon as the weather gives us a little bit of coolness, the ever-bearing ones start blooming again, whereas the spring bearers wait until late fall or winter before they start to make their flowers again. So the ever-bearing ones, um, in fact, we can write these down. Well, let's go over how they grow them first. So the farmers in the fields, especially the early, ones that want to make money early, what they do is they will cover the, their little... The fields are shaped like this. So you have uh, a path for walking, and then you have this berm. You have an irrigation ditch in the middle, and they do that. And what they, what the first thing they do in September is they cover this thing all in plastic, just totally covered like that, in clear plastic, and then they fumigate underneath it. Now, the conventional farmers have clear plastic. The organic farmers use black plastic. The conventional farmers, the clear plastic is like a greenhouse. It really warms up the soil. So when they plant those berries in October, it's like summer in there. The soil is that hot and then those plants are producing by Christmas. They're producing berries. Uh, but for homeowners, unless you have a f source for a fumigation, you, this is terrible. If you, use, if you put clear plastic over the dirt, all the weeds just come up and you have a little forest of plants underneath the clear plastic. The people who fumigate can do this because fumigation sterilizes the soil. It kills all the diseases from past strawberry crops kills the weeds, kills the weed seeds, kills the bugs, kills the diseases. Um, they're doing away with most of the fumigants. The farmers still have a few that they can, they're allowed to use. The main ones are gone, the ones that kind of ruin the ozone layer. So those are gone. Now methyl bromide was their favorite, but now they're using some other ones that hopefully won't hurt the ozone layer. Well, apparently not hurting the ozone layer. So they fumigate it. You know, they leave the plastic on for a couple days, and then they let it air out for a few more days, and then they cut the plastic. So they cut it, and then the plastic just kind of falls over the berm like that. So they have a plastic cover, and they have a machine that goes over the field and punches holes every 18 inches. Usually it's a double row, so if you look at this from the top, here's the irrigation in the middle and they have the strawberry plants arranged like this down each side, 18 inches apart. And these berms are 18 inches high, knee height. And what that does, you know, in Orange County where the soil is sand, you know, um, Irvine, uh, this area, near, especially near the Santa Ana River, the soil is very sandy, but 18 inches gives them incredibly good drainage. Lots of air in the soil. The, uh, uh, strawberry plants apparently rot fairly easily if the soil stays soggy wet. So they have, to, so even in good soil, they raise them up 18 inches. Now they grow. The main place where they grow strawberries in the U.S. is between Santa Barbara, well, actually between uh, probably uh, Ventura and San Francisco. That is the main stretch, right where the fires are in north of there. But the soil on the coastline is generally like the soil along our coastline, it's clay. So instead of 18 inches, they double that. In fact, yeah, they said it's three feet. 
So they show the, some of the farms along the coast, if you get on their websites, they'll show pictures of kids running through the fields. You see the tops of their heads. So they really raise that clay up high to make it drain just as well as the sand does. So they have to double the height, three foot uh, of raised bed. That makes it pretty easy to pick. I mean, those strawberries are right here. But that plastic keeps those hills from washing down. Otherwise, if they're not covered in plastic, then they'll just wash away. So they irrigate in here with drip system. Now, when they plant their strawberries, they get the bare root ones. Uh, I don't have any bare root plants right now, but when we get them in, um, should be a, maybe another week and a half. They have a f one or two leaves on them, just developing leaves. And then they have roots. So to get these strawberries to produce, you know, up in the central coast, they don't worry, but they don't plant strawberries this early. It's too cool up there. So in Orange County, they get their strawberries every year. They buy new strawberry plants from a farm in Northern California at the base of the Sierra Mountains. Those farms have already had, you know, 30 degree weather, 40 degree weather at night. And those strawberry plants have already got enough winter to start their spring production. So they buy those that are grown up there, refrigerated as they ship them down here, and they put them into our fields, and, and underneath here it's so warm, they think it's spring. In fact, they think it's even summer at sometimes, so they start blooming and fruiting right away. And then they'll have that crop harvesting in December, and they make the most money at that time, because they ship all across the United States in December. No other place in the U.S. can grow strawberries at that time of year. Uh, Florida usually kicks in around February. They're, they get cold, too cold in the winter um, for most parts of Florida. So we, Orange County has a niche. Orange County, San Diego County have that winter uh, strawberry production niche for the U.S. So they make a lot of money on strawberries. Now you can see these have, we planted this about two months ago. They've, they've come up pretty good. However, the problem is these strawberries probably haven't gotten a winter yet, so they're not blooming. So once they get their winter, it triggers them to make flowers and bloom. Now there's a few flowers on one plant on this side. But for the most part, these strawberries are still waiting for winter. And around here, that means they'll start blooming around March. Winter comes, they start blooming in March. Their main production is March. Well, April, you start harvest April, May, June, July into August, and then they slow down because they don't bloom much in July. It takes the berries a couple months, to, um, I think six weeks to ripen. I can't remember how fast it is. It's pretty fast. So, but we usually, by mid-August, most strawberries are slowing down their production, and the spring bearers just go to sleep at that time. Or they don't go to sleep, they just stop blooming. They don't produce anymore. Now, during the summer, almost every single strawberry plant will make runners. So, a strawberry plant generally grows in a clump with their leaves and they make berries that hang down in clusters, usually clusters of three, four, something like that, five. <clears throat> so in the spring and summer, they're primarily making flowers and berries. And then summer, they start making, in summer and fall, they make these runners that shoot out and these make new plants at the ends of the runners. So you get a more, a little more developed one, like this one. Little plant there, some roots starting to grow at the bottom. Even if you cut this off right now, before the roots are very long and stick it in dirt, it grows. They're that easy to grow. They're pretty sturdy. I mean, these leaves may wilt on you for a few days, but there's enough root there right now, eighth of an inch of root or so, that they'll get going and, and become a new plant. So strawberries. Uh, produce best their first after their first winter. Now these are kind of small for this time of year. They should be a lot bigger because this was a we started this whole thing at an unusual time. Here's a bigger one here because all the bare root strawberries that are sent are from runners. They're not plants that had produced here before. They're from runners, so they're all in their first year. Um, to make strawberries. Now, strawberry plants can live for three, four years or more. 
I mean, Sunset Magazine a while ago said if you want to be like the growers and have them produce sooner, the only way you can do that if you want to save your plants is pull them out around September, cut off most of the leaves except for one or two, put them in a Ziploc bag with some peat green moss in them, and put them in the fridge for um, a month and a half, I think they said, a month, month and a half. It probably doesn't have to be that long. Uh, you get quite a bit of chill in just a few weeks. I think it might have been just two weeks, in fact. Two weeks in the refrigerator, and then replant them. And then they've gone through their winter. They'll start flowering and fruiting by Christmas, just like the ones the growers get. So if you want to be that, uh, or you just buy new plants every year. The, the bare root strawberry plants are 50 cents to a buck. They're pretty cheap. But again, we, we have some uh, containers out in front there that have plants that are probably three or four years old. So they don't, they're not as vigorous by that time, but they still produce berries pretty well. So anyway, the strawberry growers uh, do this. Now, if they're organic strawberry growers, they put black plastic over to stop the weeds from growing. The black plastic doesn't warm up the soil quite as much as the clear plastic does. The black plastic will hold the heat in, but it won't transmit much heat through it. Most of the heat, you know, the black gets hotter on the surface and heat radiates off the black, so it's not quite as good as the clear. So the uh, organic farmers take a little longer to get their crop going, but they make more money on their crop too. Um, so if you want to do plastic on the ground, you have to use the black unless you have a, a secret source of fumigants of some sort or you have brand new dirt, that you, well, any, you buy any soil at all unless it's a not, a not really dirt, it'll have weed seeds in it that'll come up underneath the plastic. Now the organic farmers also have to rotate their crops. So we were next to an organic farm for four years and the farmer told me they were on a 10 crop rotation cycle. So that's strawberries, 10, 10 other crops before they grow strawberries again. We were next to them for four years, never saw them use the same field for strawberries. So uh, I don't know how long it took them to go through 10 crops. It was more than four years to go through 10 crops. So if you want to grow strawberries, either, you know, the problem with growing strawberries in the same soil year after year is there's remnants of their roots from past crops, and that will cause uh, more cases of root rot than you want to see. You don't want to have dead bodies from the previous year still hanging around. It takes apparently three or four years for all that to dissipate, and then you can get back to doing the same thing. It's not anything to do with soil depletion like some journalists will mention. They said, well, one crop depletes the soil of something. All the crops use the same fertilizer. It doesn't really, we know what they deplete. We can always replace that, but you can't get rid of the dead strawberry plant in the ground that easily. Fumigation does it. If you fumigate your soil, you essentially sterilize it. So of all diseases and everything. So those, the people who, you know, if you see a uh, farm that's doing strawberries in the same soil year after year, they're fumigating. The organic ones have to grow a whole bunch of other crops in between. I mean, uh, the farmer we were next to said, yeah, the only reason we grow cabbage, because cabbage doesn't make any money at all, um, is as part of rotation cycle. So a lot of the vegetables that are grown, cabbage, I'm sure squash is one of them too, are grown just as part of the rotation cycle. So they can get back to strawberries. So, so yeah. mm -hmm. you either fumigate, if you're going to just always have your strawberries here, you either fumigate or you take out all the soil and put in new soil? That, you, you can do that too. If you put in brand new soil every year, now there's one other method that you can do to uh, grow strawberries in the same spot, and that's double digging, but that's the most labor intensive. So in a farm, roots on most plants only go down a foot. So if you grow a strawberry crop here, this first, I'd even say eight and 10, 10 inches, strawberry roots don't go that deep. So they're all up here on the surface. So if you took all this soil, and piled it over here, and went down a fr one shovel deeper and piled that soil over here and reversed them going back in. Now the soil on the top has much fewer strawberry roots in it than it did uh, if he didn't do that. I've had one customer do that. He says, it worked, never do it again. 
Because it's, you know, if your soil is heavy, it's a lot of labor to do that. I mean, it's, you know, dirt is pretty cheap. Getting rid of it's more expensive. If you, you can get rid of the soil in your garden, take it to a dump, they'll take it, you know, some dumps take dirt no charge because they need dirt. So they take dirt no charge, and then you can just get, you know, some more dirt. Most soils that are good for strawberries, and you can use pure sand. Um, say 20 to 30 dollars per cubic yard. It doesn't cost that much to get soil that strawberries like. We know they love sand because um, when I, my first house I, I bought back in the 1980s had a sandbox, and within a year, some strawberries I made, in, made into that sandbox, even without me irrigating it or anything, taken over the entire sandbox. Just, they just grew right through that sandbox. So we know they like sand. In fact, it's funny, we've talked to some of the farmers who farm along the Santa Ana River. They grow strawberries. They said, oh boy, this soil along the Santa Ana River is the richest soil in Orange County. The strawberries do, it's just pure sand. It's not rich. It's just, it just breathes really well, so the plants are super healthy. So... Play sand's fine, wash sand's cheaper, it's fine. Mortar sand's a little too fine textured. So either plaster sand, concrete sand, wash sand, mortar, uh, masonry sand, or play sand. We've used all of them and, and got equally good results with the sands. You do have to fertilize, so. Um, when we start strawberry plants and you want to grow them fast, we usually use the Osmocote time-release fertilizer. If you want to be organic, the Dr. Earth Life is quite good. Now, the University of California, which does research on strawberries, told us that they use the Osmocote 14, 14, 14 for all the research. But I would tell you not to use this one because it only has three different, it's only lists three different minerals. Whereas this one, has 11 minerals in it, which is better. But th that's what this is what they were using, but they were growing them in the ground. Now, if you use our potting soil, I would say stay away from this. I don't think our potting soil has all the minerals in it. It's better to go this or the organic one. Organic ones take longer to kick in. That's the main thing. So if you start with the time-release fertilizer like this, you'll see results within a day or two. You'll see the plants start taking off. With an organic, uh, at least a week. Now this is one of the newer organics. If you get the older organics, the other color of Dr. Earth, the, the, the green one they have for tomatoes, vegetables, and things like that, um, it's just a blend of, of organic fertilizers. This one, they take that same blend and, and start fermenting it for you. So it's already half broken down. So this works a lot faster than the older, older line, they, they know that you know, other manufacturers are doing this already, fermenting the products to make them work faster, so they started doing it too. This is there, but if you open this bag, it smells like a dead rat, whereas their other ones don't have, you know, they have more earthy smell, but this one really stinks because it's being fermented so it'll work faster. And when the strawberry farm we were next to, when they fertilize their, their crop, boy, it's not like a sewer. Because <laughs> they have to use, you know, they're using liquid fertilizers. And because uh, they have an irrigation system, so they have to use something that's like sewage or smells like sewage to make it work fast enough for them. So, Okay, now the different strawberries... So we like the everbearing better, however, the advantage of the spring bearers, now the book says there's three different categories, um, everbearing, spring bearing, which is a, um, I guess a short day berry, and then a neutral day. And it's too confusing. We just use, most people just say everbearing, which have the potential of bearing year-round, and then the spring bearing, which mainly bear up until, they make flowers uh, spring and up until summer, until it gets hot. So the, ever, the advantage of the spring bearing ones, 
is that they make the same number of berries per plant per year as the everbearing, but they make it in a shorter amount of time. So if you want fewer plants, the spring bearers may be the better ones to get. They'll make all their berries in the spring, but if you'd rather have your berries scattered throughout the year, you get the everbearers and you'll get a longer season. You'll need more plants to do the same thing. Um, the two big names that we've always sold are Seascape and Albion. These, for the last five years, these are the two major ones. Uh, both are big, excellent flavor. I would have to say Albion's the best we've ever eaten. However, Albion has had some disease issues lately, so we may be moving away from Albion in the future and going with another one called Sweet Ann, but we don't have any Sweet Anns today. I've got Seascape and Albion. Sweet Ann is supposed to be derived from the Albion, but uh, I haven't, I actually haven't eaten that one yet. We sell it so fast uh, when we get it. But those are some of the ever bearers. The spring bearing one, Sequoia. Now Sequoia was developed in the 50s or 60s by University of California, right, I believe right here in Irvine. They have a field station in Irvine. And this was the first good strawberry for Southern California. Um, it still tastes really good. The main disadvantage to Sequoia is it doesn't have much hang time. So it's ripe in the field, it's great. Two days later, it's already mush. Whereas Albion Seascape Sweet Ann usually have one week of hang time. So you don't have to go out there every day and pick. You can wait till the weekend and these, will be, these won't have turned to mush by that time. But the Sequoias, if you don't mind picking daily, that's an awful good strawberry. And Sequoias are you know, still used at quite a few U-Pick farms. And sequoias, you know, occasionally you get these things that are that big. So uh, that's still a good one. Chandler, and back in the 80s and 90s, Chandler was number one. Sequoias was number one in the 60s. Chandler in the 1980s was number one. There was one in between called Douglas, but we, have, we can't find Douglas anymore. But Chandlers are still real pop. They said a lot of... You pick farms around the whole United States, use Chandler. Quite a good strawberry. Better hang time than Sequoia. So these are the ones that we do most of it with. Uh, there's, I don't know, I have one out there called Camarosa, which I think is a little too firm. Some of the uh, commercial store ones are Camarosas. I think they're too, I think they're too crispy. Uh, but a lot of farms were by Camarosa, and I don't recall if Camarosa is a spring bear or an ever bear. I think it's on our website, which, which one it is. Um, now, there's some new strawberries out, but they're just novelties. So, this one is called Tarpon, and the reason they like it is because instead of the flowers being white. This one had petals on it, but they fell off overnight. Uh, they have pink flowers. But what we've seen of the ones with the pretty flowers is the main disadvantage of them, they're more subject to mildew on the leaves. None of these get much mildew. Um, although we might bring one in, and I haven't eaten one yet. But there is a, a strawberry out there, and I, and I don't recall what it is, if it's a spring bear or an ever bear, but there's one called Monterey. And the, grower, and the University of California says this one's got this incredible artificial sweet aftertaste. Well, you know, kind of a, like when you eat artificial sweeteners, it leaves that aftertaste for a while. They said this one does the same thing, but this one is prone to mildew. So don't get, you know, we'll, we'll, we might bring some in again. That was, it's fun to see if, if, that, if it actually is true. I haven't eaten one yet. And then this is a European strawberry. Now, I was looking out there because we had a whole bunch of these the other week, but I think someone bought us out. But this is the Alpine strawberry, also known as woodland strawberry from Europe. Um, they don't make runners like the strawberries that we carry do. Uh, they just make clumps of 
plants. The strawberries they make are only about as big as your fingernails. Real small strawberries, but they seem to have the same amount of flavor in each berry as the big ones do. So if you eat one of these, they're really potent flavored, but they're just kind of small. Um, and they bear spring and summer. This one doesn't have anything going on at the moment. So you don't get much in the, in the fall or winter like some of the ever bearers do. This one's called Pineapple Crush. It happens to be a yellow one. So this is a yellow version of the Alpine. Uh, Alexand Alexander is a, red, a famous red uh, Alpine strawberry. And a lot of people like them, but again, you're not going to get, you know, you'll still be hungry after you eat a few because they're, they're only about as big as your fingernails. So right now, the way we're selling strawberries, we have six packs. And you see they're already blooming. Now, the, commercially, what they do in the fields, they said they, the first bloom, they snap off. They said the plant's still so small, these berries will be small too. So if they snap off the first set of flowers, by the time the second set come out, the leaves will be pretty well developed like these, and they'll be able to support the bigger berries. So they usually snap off just the first set of flowers, just to get the plants a chance to get going. Six packs, these are $3.99, which makes each one about 50 cents. Four, no, four divided by six, whatever that comes to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, strawberries are getting more bugs now than they used to. Everything seems to be getting more bugs now than it used to. The two main bugs that strawberries get, spider mites and thrips. Thrips is kind of the new one. We never had problems with thrips before. Spider mites will make all the leaves turn gray and have webs little tiny webs. Spider mites are actually miniature spiders that will suck one cell of the leaf at a time till, so the, cell, the, the leaf starts turning, has white dots all over it, looks kind of grayish green. So it kind of just shuts the plant down. Um, and I remember smelling the oil, so they spray oil over the fields. Horticultural oils are considered organic because what they do is you spray oil on the leaves, it covers the air holes of the spider mite, it can't breathe for half an hour, it's dead. The oil evaporates and it's gone, so the next day you can pick strawberries and nothing. there's no remnants of the oil. Uh, so there's, we sell both the neem oil, which is an organic oil, source of oil, it's a plant oil, and we have uh, mineral oil, which is a petroleum source, the mineral oil actually has less smell than the plant oil. This plant oil has a bit of sulfur in it, whereas the uh, horticultural oil has no smell at all. Is it's got the organic label. So they're both very clean as far as, you know, eating them. So Now, the rules about oil is don't spray when it's raining because the oil doesn't evaporate, and don't spray if it's misty out. You want to spray, the warmer the day is when you spray the oil, the better up until about 95 degrees. So it's better if it's, say, 60 to 90 degrees when you spray the oil so it can evaporate. I always thought you're supposed to spray oil when it was cold so it wouldn't burn, but when it's cold, it doesn't evaporate, the leaves die anyway because they can't breathe when the oil's on them. So. And the spider mite, uh, the thrips, will actually scar the fruit itself. So the thrips are getting into the flowers and scarring the embryo of the fruit as it grows. They leave um, the surface of the strawberry looks like sandpaper. Um, there's another bug that gets in there too that pierces the, the, the strawberries and deforms them. I don't know how to stop that one uh, without using chemical but uh, this is the Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. It's spinosad, which controls thrips along with all the chewing insects. In fact, another bug that can cause trouble on strawberries if you're growing them on the ground is 
pill bugs. They make holes in ripe fruit. Uh, and this will kill the pill bugs too. They have to eat it. It won't kill them on, well, it will kill them on contact, but most pill bugs hide while you're spraying. Come out at night, take a bite, this will kill them. This won't kill snails or slugs, which can also do damage. And that's one reason we like to grow strawberries in pots, because if you can keep the strawberries off the ground, it helps. I mean, uh, one method some of our customers use is stacked, you know, stacking pots. It's like this one stacked. You can stack them like this. This is sitting on top of an upside down pot in the middle. We've done even bigger pots like this, this, this. And uh, again, you can use up a lot of room in that bottom pot just by putting an upside down container in there. And then the soil that we use for strawberries is our acid mix, which is the half volcanic rock, half peat moss. And that's what's in here. Um, they've done well in that, our blueberries, same soil, but um, again, pure sand works. We've done pure sand. It's just that if this was pure sand, instead of weighing about uh, 40 pounds, that would be closer to 150. <laughs> Sand's a bit heavy. That's the only disadvantage with it. I mean, dirt's even heavier. Real dirt is heavier than sand, but sand is strawberry heaven. If you want to see what a strawberry plant can do, try it one in sand. You'll be just amazed. So, but this is also very, very good. The um, oil, do you do that on like a weekly basis or just once? Well, hopefully once we'll do it. Although with spider mites, the oil kills the the any mite moving around will kill it, but it can't kill the eggs. So if there's a lot of eggs already, then you might have to go through a week later and hit it again. So let the eggs hatch, and then you'll kill them again. So you might have to do it twice. And a lot of times we use oil, and it, it, you won't see the problem again. And, you know, the, in nature, there are other mites that eat spider mites. So hopefully, you know, if, if you have a few mites left, the good mites will clean up. The difference between a good mite and a bad mite, the bad mites move very slowly. The good mites are just like lions and tigers. They, you know, you see this little red dot moving around that speed. That's a good mite. The ones that move that fast. But that's what they look like. They're little red dots that you just see. They're they're going. They're moving on that leaf, looking for things to eat. So. We sprayed a whole nursery with oil this last summer. We had mites all over the place. Yeah. So we do sell one that you attach to the hose and just blast away. So oil doesn't really hurt anything um, that has leaves or anything on it. If you don't spray it, you know, if you spray it during the right weather pattern. So do you just let them grow all the babies that they want to? Or to well, once the season for fruiting is here, these take away from fruiting. Uh -huh. So if you, now the fault with Albion, they said, is Albion will make a lot of runners while it's supposed to be fruiting. And you uh, keep clipping those off. Okay. So that's the fault of Albion. They said Sweet Ann doesn't do it, so it produces more fruit than the Albions do. So that's the one fault with Albion. Otherwise, Albion is an incredible strawberry. So you can grow these and make new plants, or you know you can even put them back in the same pot. Now, uh, the distance between plants, ideal is 18, but well, uh, it's not really 18. So up in the northern part of the state where they have this, they're not hunting, they're not, their goal isn't the winter crop, it's just the spring and summer crop. Well, they have, they'll let their plants grow together up, to, they said, as close as six inches between crowns. And at that point, they'll still get more and more strawberries. They're, you know, they're getting, starting to get a little smaller since the plants are getting squeezed together. But they say you know, six, six inches is enough room for one strawberry plant. So if you want to space them in the pot six inches apart, that's fine. You'll get more berries per square foot that way. They might not be quite as big, but they'll still be pretty good size. Are those the strawberry pots? Okay. These nice 
Yeah, strawberry pots, I would tell you, are better as herb pots. Because the strawberry pots, you know, each pocket's this big. Yeah. It's like, well, okay, if the plant's two foot across, in a, you know, it's, just, it's just not proportional right. Now, if you use the wrong potting soils, like miracle Grow or something else, yeah, the strawberry plants only get this big. And they'll be fine in the strawberry pot. But if you use the right soil in the strawberry plant, it's just not big enough for strawberry plants. It's big enough for some herbs or some succulents, but the strawberries are, you know, they get, if they're healthy, they're big. So. Okay, any questions on strawberries today? Do they have a winter chill requirement, like fruit trees? Not much. It's, they have it. So generally, um, I'm not sure if it's just the day length. They have to go through a short, you know, get down to the shortest day and then come back. But they, well, they do chill them. Yeah, that's why they grow them up north, so they get their chill, and then that makes them produce. So they have a chill requirement. It may only be 100, or 100 hours or so, because I don't think we've ever had a year when the strawberries didn't produce it overwintered. So it's... Well, this last winter, we told people about 280. It wasn't that low because March was really, really cool. The year before that was probably right around 250. It wasn't very good. Yeah. I mean, it depends who you listen to. The University of California's chill meter is set on a different uh, calculation than ours. So they use the um, calculation where you only get chill below 45 and above 34. That doesn't work here. We don't. St we just don't drop that cold. The other chill, the other chill uh, calculations are based on below 55. They say below 55 you get chill. You just don't get much. You get more chill. Down at 45 you get the most chill per hour. At 55 you get very little chill per hour, but you still get chill, and you get less chill as you approach 34. But you get apparently you get more than one hour of chill for every hour you spent at 45. They said it's not a straight line like the University of California's calculation. It's a bell curve. So you get the most chill at a certain temperature and less chill before and after, above and below. And then and with using those calculations, yeah, if we get chill below 55, we had a lot of temperature below 55, uh, just not much below 45 last year. So. University of Utah came up with the other calculation, which we think is more correct. And we don't know why University of California doesn't go toward that one, because you know, their chill meter said we only had like 70 hours last year, this earlier this year. It's like, OK, everybody's going, no, sorry, that's not right. <laughs> but they, I don't know if they fixed it. Um, OK, so let's switch over to blueberries. Blueberries, now blueberries are native um, throughout North America. Well, North America east of the Rockies. Of course, the Rockies go all the way up into Alaska, so there's some blueberries native to Alaska. And, and throughout Canada uh, and the eastern United States. So most of the northern blueberries don't work here. They need 700, 800 hours of chill, at, or at least 500 hours of chill, which we rarely, rarely ever get. So we're stuck with the blueberries from the deep south, because blueberries are native all the way down to the southern tip of Florida. So those are the blueberries that we grow the most. Um, they're called the southern high bush. There's northern high bush blueberries. The, the high bush, they grow up to six feet, or even sometimes a little taller. Uh, there's also northern low bush. So a lot of people are know, you know, that are from say New England. Remember the blueberries that were like this tall, 18 inches tall, that were just fruited on the ground. Those are the northern low bush. But these are high bush ones, and this is a representative. This is actually a northern high bush. We bought this as a 
as a Florida blueberry, but apparently it's not because it doesn't wake up at the right time. Uh, this particular specimen came from a nursery in Michigan, and we think they kind of messed up and sent one of the Michigan varieties to us. So even though it was labeled as a Florida variety, the, all the Florida varieties we have usually start blooming in January or February. This thing starts blooming every year around August or July. And here it's making flowers right now. It doesn't know what it's doing. So it's out of its climate. It still grows, it doesn't produce much, but we just kept it around. It still makes a few, there's a real tiny blueberry there. So it makes a few for us. So it's just interesting to have around. It still grows the same height. So what blueberries do is they grow new stems every year. So this stem grew this year. This stem grew last year, but never uh, leafed out very well because of the lack of winter. But what they normally do is they grow a, a stem straight up from the base of the plant somewhere, just like a climbing rose does, stem straight up. The second year, the stem will branch out and produce flowers and fruit all along the stem. And then it makes side branches. This only made like one side branch this year. Um, and then the side branches will then bloom along, along their length the next spring and then they'll side branch again. And after about five years, it's just this real branchy thing that doesn't have much more surface area to make flowers and fruit. So the, typically we allow branches on a blueberry to exist for maybe five, six years and you clip it off as low as you can not to disturb the surrounding branches and then make room for new ones to come out that will then uh, do a real good job in flowering and fruiting. I mean, when you have a blueberry plant that's like on its second year, it's pretty impressive because all those branches, um, like this plant right here, almost every branch on this is on is just finishing up its first year. So th uh, these branches will be blueberries from bottom to the top this next spring. Real impressive when they do that. They make so many blueberries on the stems. It's like an endless row of blueberries. There's not much room between the blueberries on the stems. Is that the southern high bush? This is southern high bush. Mm -hmm. Now, we started these, we finally started growing our own, and for one of the reasons, because one of our major blueberry supplier went out of business this last year. So we had to hunt for more blueberries. We bought these in from a grower uh, down in Florida, and they were in containers that were that big, and they were about this tall when we got them. So even though they were very young, this first year they've grown. Well, this one, Jubilee, is apparently the most vigorous of the uh, southern highbush blueberries. You can see how much it's grown this year. Uh, so it'll make... Uh, I would estimate three or four handfuls of blueberries this next spring. And then uh, two years from now, it'll be about five by five, and it can probably make closer to, if you have enough, you know, big enough container and enough soil around or in the ground, uh, it'll be, say, this big, and then it'll make closer to 10 pounds of berries a week uh, per year. And then when it's full grown, uh, after that, earlier this year, we had a blueberry in a half barrel, which is about the same volume as this trash can. And it was about seven or eight foot across and about five foot in the pot. It was this big. And that thing would make, you know, about 12 to 15 pounds of berries per year. Pretty impressive plant. We hated to sell it. Some bought it. Um, but they, they can produce quite a few. Now, blueberries, the southern high bush are partially self-fertile. So one plant will make quite a few berries, but if you have two different ones that bloom at the same time, then you'll have a full crop, maybe one quarter to one third more. And some of the books also say the berries are bigger because when they pollinate themselves, sometimes they don't get the full amount of seeds in the fruit. You know, the seeds are all small, you don't notice them, but if they don't have all their seeds, the fruit comes out smaller. So you get all the seeds you need to have pollination from a different plant. So 
So we do southern highbush blueberries. Um, they need an acid soil. Now, blueberries are grown commercially in California now. They, you know, Florida is hot. The Central Valley of California is almost as hot. I mean, Florida gets hot by April. Central Valley, maybe by May, they're pretty hot. But uh, they like the summer heat. They need some chill. Now, so far, anything from Florida has never failed to produce here. Even with the years when we had maybe 100 hours of chill, that was 2014, the least, the least amount of chill you've ever seen. Um, all the Florida blueberries woke up earlier and had a great crop. So they, apparently they need like 50 hours of chill or something like that. But for some reason, they list some of the Florida blueberries as having five, 400 hours. And we don't know why that happened. Like South Moon, some people say, can we really grow South Moon here? It says 400 hours in the book. I don't know where they got those hours from. It needs like 50 or 40. Something like that. It's never failed to produce a huge crop for us every year without the chill, so we know it doesn't need any, but uh, or it needs very, very little. So anything from Florida doesn't need to chill. Now, the other parts of the Deep South have to have more chill. So Jubilee, which is incredibly vigorous when it has its chill, missed one year for us. I think it was 2014. Didn't, didn't wake up on time, didn't produce much. So this probably needs uh, maybe 150, 200 hours of chill. It normally will produce here, but we missed a year when we had those really warm winters. And then I have one more out there that was our main blueberry back in the 80s. So let's start writing some names down. So uh, O'Neill, which was our best blueberry in the 1980s, needs about 300 hours and it's from New Jersey the book says O'Neill is either the furthest north southern highbush blueberry or it's the lowest chill northern highbush blueberry because <laughs> it's in that zone where both species exist incredibly good blueberry it was our favorite one in the 1980s when we had chill now it's like, okay, if you live near the Santa Ana River, you know, all the big rivers have more chill than the hills. So if you're on the hilltop, forget O'Neill. Um, if you live near the Santa Ana River or near any of the little rivers that run through Orange County, you can give it a good shot because, uh, like the Santa Ana River, we think gets 400, 500 hours of chill every winter. The river beds, you know, cold air flows to the ocean like water does, well, it's in the same place. So uh, I have a friend who lives a block off the Santa Ana River, and they can grow all the different walnuts and cherries and things that I wouldn't dream of, uh, pears that need 400, 500 hours of chill. And I'm just amazed at what that he grows in his yard. <laughs> so if you live in anywhere where the cold air collects in the wintertime, you might do well with O'Neill, because that is you know, the real rich, blueberry muffin type fragrance that you get off of that berry. Um, Jubilee is quite good too. So we think Jubilee may need 200 hours of chill. And it's from Mississippi. And if you've been to Mississippi, it's cold in the winter. It's, I don't know, the, the Gulf of, a Mex of, New Me of Mexico is really an odd piece of water. Because, you know, like our ocean here is usually 55 to degrees in the winter and maybe this year up to 70 degrees in the summer. It it's doesn't change that much. The Gulf of Mexico, because I lived on the, in, on, in Galveston for a few years, summer is like, I don't know, you walk in the water, it feels like you're in a bath. It's like 90, 80, 90 degrees. <laughs> So nothing's cool around the Gulf in the summertime. In the winter, it's like 40. I didn't think that water would get that cold, since our water doesn't get that cold, but their water gets 40. So they get ice on the beach. Just crazy. And it's, it's like 200 miles south of California. It's, it gets incredibly cold in the Gulf. So Mississippi 
it's easy for them to get those 200 hours. Even though winter only lasts a few months, it's cold when it's winter down there. So Jubilee uh, needs a little bit of chill. And then the ones we have in stock right now, South Moon, uh, Misty, and Sunshine Blue. Um, they they ripen in this order. So South Moon's early, Misty is mid early to mid, and Sunshine Blue's mid to late season. Um, early is around April, May, mid seasons, May, June, late seasons, maybe late May through July for Sunshine Blue. Now blueberries have the real heavy period of, of harvesting, but they never do quit. Totally. Well, they usually have a month after their main bloom, main harvest, they kind of don't do anything for about a month. And then by midsummer, they're starting to make berries again. They don't make as much as they do, as, definitely as in the spring, but like even this one made a few now. It's like in my house, uh, I had 10 pots like this of blueberry plants. In, say, midfall, you can go out there and get a handful every morning off of 10 plants. By December, I was only getting maybe five or six berries a morning. And by late December, nothing. It kind of quit by then. And then the plant starts blooming and you get your spring crop going. So, uh, like one of our customers would bring me pictures of his blueberries. He'd have 15-gallon buckets, um, 20 of them on his back patio with blueberry plants in them. And he says, boy, my grandkids want to come in over every week and search for those berries. He says this was really nice for his, for his uh, grandkids. They wanted to come to his house every week to search. So that was a bonus for him. So, but anyway, South Moon Misty, Sunshine Blue, chill is not an issue. Um, I would tell you Sunshine Blue couldn't pollinate South Moon. It just blooms too far off, but these two are close. And then... At the end of this month, we'll be getting in some more blueberries. The other ones, um, emerald and jewel. I'll put jewel here. Jewel is the earliest one we'll have. This one blooms right before south moon. They're really close, though. And these two, uh, we would have to say, are our best two tasting ones. You know, if you don't grow O'Neill... And don't grow Jubilee, because Jubilee is awful good, too. Jewel and South Moon are really good. I would say South Moon has a slight nod over Jewel, but they're both really good, and they're both big. They're penny to nickel-sized blueberries. Now, something happened to Misty. When I grew Misty in the 1980s, I would get some berries on my plants that were the size of quarters. Really big, honking blueberries. But the misties we get nowadays don't do it. Now the, I used to get misties from the nursery in Michigan. And now we get them from a nursery and out of Florida, and they're not the same size. So I'm not sure what's going on there. So, yes. Well, none of these, these are all Florida blueberries. They don't need any chill. We've never had them even hesitate to bloom in the winter. And the warmer the winter, the earlier it seems they bloom. I mean, there's one other blueberry that we'll have next year, not this year, that goes in front of these. It's Star. So Star is the first one to wake up, then Jewel, then South Moon, then Misty, then Sunshine. Actually, Emerald. You would stick Emerald right about here. So that's the order they bloom, and that's the order they produce fruit. So we're getting Jewel in and Emerald in. Now, Jewel, Emerald, and Star are the big three that are grown commercially on U-Pick farms in the Deep South. South Moon isn't, it has some root rot problems. Uh, so, at a farm wouldn't do it, I would say, don't worry, we don't lose. In our soil, you would not lose the South Moon. Maybe, and if you use Miracle Potting Soil, it would rot in there. But in our acid mix, uh, the chance of losing a South Moon are pretty remote. Dave Wilson's taste test, they show South Moon as the number one southern highbush blueberry. But they don't have O'Neill on that list, so. 
Now there's one other blueberry we get in, which is a different kind of blueberry. It's called pink lemonade. This is a rabbit eye hybrid. Now rabbit eyes are, are really good tasting blueberries. We stop carrying them totally because the other ra the normal rabbit eyes because um, you need they will not make any fruit without cross pollinization. And it just drove us nuts because we'd order them from the nurseries. I'd order a Bonita and some other one they're supposed to cross. And every year they'd send me one of the two. It's like, this is not working. <laughs> if you grow all these rabbit eye blueberries and there's not a single fruit on them because they, they need the cross pollination. It was just, we just gave up after a couple of years because two years in a row they would send us one of the two we asked for. It's like, we're not, we're not getting what we want. Now pink lemonade is a hybrid. It produces by itself. Now it would produce a hair more if it had another rabbit eye around it, but it produces a pretty good crop. And the nice thing about pink lemonade, it's not only late, it ripens starting in July, July, August. It's pink or red. Now, the birds in my yard, the, the, the blue jays or scrub jays, whatever, they get used to the berries, the blueberries going from pink to blue before they eat them. Well, the pink lemonades are ripe when they're pink, so the birds don't pick them, <laughs> which was kind of neat. I mean, I, I think they figure it out at the end, but. Uh, you can get a lot of your pink lemonade berries off of there without any bird predation at all because they're pink when you pick them. And if you close your eyes, you can say, oh, there's a slight lemonade flavor to that. All the bear, you know, all the blueberries taste great. A few of them have just a little more of that aroma that associated with muffins. And that's South Moon, Jewel, O'Neill have a slightly richer fragrance to them, but they all have that nice sweet tart um, taste. And I would tell you there's more, you know, if you pick a handful of berries, there's probably more variation on each uh, from all the berries in one plant than there is between plants. They're all pretty darn good. So pink lemonade has a role to play. It's, it's really late. Its main crop is real late. So birds, uh, and I didn't bring them up here. There's a couple things we use to scare birds off. I have one friend up in the canyon that, you know, they just say, oh, we grow, we have a chicken coop, so we just grow our blueberries in the chicken coop. Just a fenced off area, and they just grow them in there, and that's fine. For the rest of us, uh, now we tried this, the scarecrow owl, that works for like two days, they get used to it. So it's not the best. Um, the. Scarum tape works pretty good. So this is a uh, mylar tape that's red on one side and silver on the other. And if you hang it horizontally, if you go up to Napa Valley, they use this all over Napa Valley. It's pretty neat looking. So they put a few twists in it. And then if there's any breeze at all, the tape just kind of rotates back and forth. And the silver and the red just streaks across the yard really fast. It, it just drives the birds crazy. They don't like that. You know, suddenly it goes red and zing and goes down to silver or back to red. It's back and forth across the yard with those colors, and the birds hate that. Uh, this can keep them away for a few weeks. The other one that's fun is this blow up snake. I mean, I heard about snakes back before they even made this that birds didn't like them. So I had uh, 20 fig trees in my backyard. And, Every summer was like an aviary out there. It was just crazy. The birds were taking every fig. So I went to Disneyland and bought one of those. They had a real neat rubber snake that was about three foot long. Hung it in the tree. Didn't hear a bird for two weeks. They didn't like that snake at all. And if you keep moving this around your yard all the time, it's, it's hard for them to get used to it. So that works pretty good too.
is birds are a problem with blueberries. What about the leaves? Are they not this is Yeah, so you have to keep doing something different. Here's uh, some flowers on a sunshine blue. Sunshine blue um, is the only one that has, is you can call it kind of a dwarf one. So most blueberries grow like this, five foot by five foot pretty easily. And you can trim them to be smaller so they don't, you know, the one thing blueberries don't like is to get dry. So make sure that if they're a big plant in a small pot that you water enough, because if they dry out once, they'll drop their leaves, and it takes a year to get them back to where they were before they got dry, or else, you know, just throw them out and start over again. So they really have no good drought tolerance at all. Uh, so make sure that you have them. Now, they don't like our native soil. So that's one problem with blueberries is the soil here is too alkaline for them. So they will not grow in the native soil unless you can acidify it. Now, the farms that grow blueberries, uh, they take a year to acidify the soil. You may not want to take that long time. So the year before they plant blueberries, they put sulfur in the fields. There are bacteria in the ground that eat the sulfur and spit out hydrosulfuric acid. That lowers the pH somewhat. But they tell me they also irrigate with water with acid in it. So they have that advantage. Uh, we just say use your acid mix potting soil. Its pH is around five and a half to six, so it's acidic enough. And here, this plant's been in there closing. Uh, it's getting close to ten years now. Um, now, once in a while, uh, a couple years ago, so about the seventh year in the pot, leaves are getting pale. So we knew it was getting kind of alkaline in there. So we threw some sulfate, didn't bring the bag up. Sulfate ammonia is highly acidic fertilizer. Threw it in the pot, nice and green again. So you may have to use a chemical fertilizer. Well, there's other chemicals too. We have uh, hydrangea bluing formula, which is aluminum sulfate, which is highly acidic. But the sulfate ammonia is traditional for the farms. Put that sulfate ammonia on there, it's highly acidic. And that certainly greened them up real well. And it's, it's been holding for a few more years with just that one dose of sulfate ammonia. So they don't need a whole lot of fertilizer. Um, we were throwing on our organic fertilizer once a season on our blueberries. The main thing is lots of water. Don't let them dry out. You can trim them to keep them from getting too big so they don't dry out. Any other questions on the blueberries? Is there pruning for this Well, mainly it is just getting rid of the older branches. Now, you can shape them up. You know, a lot, I don't know why. You see, you buy blueberries from other stores. They're all like these little mounds. They, they made little mounds out of them. A foot tall, this wide. I don't know why they do that. Because this is a normal shape. It's like a, a rambling rose or something. They're more upright. But you buy them from anyone else, or just they've trimmed down these little mounds. I think they're trying to make them look like northern blue, uh, the low bush blueberries. But uh, maybe it's easier to transport. But they're normally upright. The stems grow up like climbing rows. So, so like some of these branches, this probably should probably get rid of this branch and this branch. It's making new ones. Hopefully we get enough winter this year to make it really come out in new growth. But that is the northern blueberry. And I will have to mention, uh, South Moon isn't the best blueberry at making new stems. I have a South Moon in my house that's about ten year, well, 8 years old. It still hasn't made a new cane yet. Uh, this one has already made two new canes since we got it. This was the original, well... This was the original branch when we got it, and then it made this one off of that, and then it made these two new ones already. And if I got this one, I would just plant it this this way. It just kind of leaned over in the pot. But most blueberries are very good at making new stems. Like this Misty made like six new stems from the time we've gotten it. And every one gets longer and longer until they reach the five foot, six foot height that's total.
Yeah. Yeah, they will start new plants off the roots and the stems, when they hit the ground, they'll often root and start a new plant that way too. So, We haven't propagated blueberries before, but we've seen roots come out of the stems, just break it off and stick it in the pot, and that one grows too. So uh, the growers apparently do it by cuttings, but we haven't tried our own. I mean, there's a lot of blueberries that are out there, but we can't get them. The University of Florida created a whole bunch of blueberries, and they say not for sale to California. I think they're jealous of our hort ag culture out here, so they don't want to sell the Florida ones to California. Um, the emerald is one that they're not allowing the Florida growers to send out here, but someone out in Oregon got a hold of some, and they'll sell them to us. <laughs> so, uh, but there's a whole bunch of what, you know, you look at the catalogs, you go, oh, I want that one and that one, Rebel and all these, and they're not allowed, you know, real big size blueberries and all. Like, the, everything we're selling here is like 20 years old, 30 years old. All the new stuff is being held back in Florida. In fact, uh, you know, just 10 years ago, we sold Millennium and a few other blueberries, and then suddenly the company said, oh, we can't sell them to you anymore. University of Florida is not allowing us to. Do they sell them, I mean, in the nurseries at Florida, the people that live in Florida? Mm -hmm. So theoretically, you could go to Florida and buy them and then. Yeah, bring them back. Can you bring them back to California? Not supposed to, but there's not a very good policing. Yeah. We have relatives in Florida. Uh. Yes. Of the varieties, um, what would you say the top three um, easiest ones to grow, given our climate? Well, there, there's no difference in ease. The only ones is the ones, you know, the two that need more chill. I wouldn't promote that much, but there's no. The, these aren't difficult. You just basically just water. If you start them in the right soil and you feed them, then it's just the watering. If you water enough, they do fine. So. Yeah, one good point. I didn't forget to, if you want to put them in the ground, um, just dig out a big area and fill it with their acid mix. And if you, the more clayish it is, the higher you make your, you know, so you can, instead of making a bed at ground level, you can actually take all that dirt you pulled out of the hole and make big walls like this and then fill this with the acid mix like, like this. So it's above ground level, that makes it drain better and then you have your berry plants up here. So you can do stuff like that or get some concrete blocks, some cinder blocks, stack them up, you don't even have to, you don't even have to cement them together and then fill that area with their acid mix. That's what I did at my last hospital of that. We just, one block high, so we dug into the earth, because our soil wouldn't drain at all, dug in the dirt maybe eight inches into the ground and then eight inches above the ground and filled it with three bags of acid mix and grew blueberry plants bigger than this. Now we tried it with one bag of acid mix, wouldn't grow taller than a foot. That's not enough of the soil around here is just too alkaline and wouldn't grow at all or wouldn't grow much. It grew a little bit, but not, not, much, you know, not any bigger than, say, these plants here. So you need a lot more soil in the ground to make them do well. In a pot, you know, that's just one bag in that pot, and it's fine uh, because it's isolated from the native soil. So we do have some customers who have actually made blueberry hedges in their yard, just a trench of our acid mix and planted blueberries in the trench. And throw the sulfate ammonia on there, they'll be happy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Strawberries on our table out this side, blueberries on our table out that door there. And I'll, again, uh, two weeks I should have the strawberry bare roots, and by the after Thanksgiving, I think it's when the other blueberries are arriving. Same price as these. Oh, um, these were $17.99 in these pots.